Hello, I'm Jeff Wagner, and for the next little while, we're going to take a look at Solaris and pipelines in the back end. Um, so far, you guys have seen an awful lot of work inside of USD, inside of Houdini, inside of uh, Solaris. So now we want to take a step back and see how we can work with that scene efficiently, how we can render it at the command line, and uh, a few more things. And also cover a topic that I sort of forgot in the first session, which is on attributes and primvars. So Solaris departments and pipelines. Um, we want to focus on render delegates and Hydra. Hydra is uh, the key component for us because as artists we need to see things and to be honest the whole reason why USD exists is to support the creation of images in Hydra. And uh, one of the things that uh, is uh, added by side effects is this thing called Husk which is a command line render tool and uh, it uses uh, and it's powered by Hydra. Um, also taking a look at some of the pipeline needs and then an interesting discussion about truth and USD and, uh, and what I mean by that. And finally, the geometry attributes and USD prim bars, we need to cover that as well. So render delegates and Hydra. Um, it pipelines exist to support artists, but artists also need to support the pipeline. Um, and the artists need to see things. They need to see uh, their work progress. They need to see their work evaluated consistently. So when you get approvals or when you say this is good enough and you put it into the into the pipeline, whether you're just a single sole user saving a file to disk or in a very, very large studio, you know how you got there and you know how to fix when it breaks. And USD is a great platform for that. And if you save the hip file that generates the USD, uh, you're miles ahead. So Hydra turns USD and images uh, via these render delegates. And that's a very important topic that we're going to cover very soon. So viewport Hydra render delegates. Um, we have to understand that Hydra is a framework from Pixar. Um, it's a part of the USD package that enables the communication uh, between Houdini, uh, the multiple scene graphs and multiple renderers. And uh, so you can actually have multiple scene graphs feed uh, Hydra. Um, the fact that Hydra is exposed as a viewport inside of Solaris um, is very convenient. And uh, the fact that it supports multiple renders uh, speaks to the, 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 the profoundness of USD in, in the way that it was developed and conceived. So another important topic that we would like to cover is how LOPs evaluate. And we took spirit and inspiration from the way that the Houdini viewport, the object viewport works with SOPs and, and operators and how the viewport drives cooking. So um, Solaris works pretty much the same way in that the Hydra viewport drives LOP evaluation to its completeness. Obviously there's a first pass at the operators to not even to build the scene graphs. Um, there's a very efficient way for um, when you're loading scene graphs off of disk that uh, if you don't have a viewport, it won't evaluate. It'll just evaluate, it'll just read the scene graph and not load any data into memory until you start evaluating the LOPs into the viewport. And again, it's similar to Houdini's viewport driving SOP cooking. So we want to take a look at what really drives a LOP cook because that's really important. And it is kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple. Um, it's uh, basically the same way that SOPs work. There's a look at the, the node that has the display flag on it, and we traverse the tree upwards, doing an evaluation of all the operators, building the dependency graph, and then we evaluate top down. But it's doing a bit more than that. Actually, a lot of these LOPs will cache data and in interesting ways to, to minimize the amount of uh, cooking, because the whole goal behind uh, using Hydra is to um, only load the geometry in once. And then Hydra is very good at that. And then it gives you really quick ways of rendering by just changing attributes on primitives. So Hydra is very good at taking any attributes that change without actually having to reload the primitive. Unless, and the only thing that really breaks this whole thing is if you decide to load in a new scene graph or load in some brand new geometry. Even then, it'll just load the geometry into the graph. But for instance, if you delete and undelete a big part of the operators or you're using switch operators, switch into completely different scene graphs, the viewport has to reconstruct the geometry. So you're gonna get a big hit there. And you try and avoid that as you work. So, and as I, and R&D, um, 
we're driven by making things happen the way the artist wants it to happen as fast as possible. And it's safe to say that this is a constant work in progress as USD starts to be implemented into, into more pipelines. Um, all these lumps and bumps that you'd expect, uh, we're trying to smooth them out to give artists the fastest, most comprehensive way of working with USD. And we're also supporting working with a large, massive pipelines. So working with very large scale USD scenes uh, requires careful work inside of the stage so you don't uh, force revaluations. And we're looking at all the different cases and uh, trying to make it as, as, as uh, a powerful and efficient way of working with USD as possible. And it is all work in progress. And Houdini 18.0 is receiving from backports from current builds internally as we move forward. So here's a, a look at uh, Hydro Viewport driving cooks of LOPs. So, um, so LOP cooking informs the LOP graph construction, that's for sure. So as LOPs evaluate, uh, the LOP graph will construct the data. And here's some performance tips. Um, as with SOPs, um, the idea is to build your scene graph further up, doing all your sub-layers uh, and all of your references and all your grafting. And so once you compose your scene graph into the viewport, um, then you can do edits after that. And as of course, you can put down layer breaks and, uh, and really control what it is that you do. And another thing is you can unload what you don't need to see in the scene graph tree. So um, if you are loading in payloads, um, in this particular case that was built for the market scene, there really isn't any payloads. Um, but if we were to take advantage of payloads, which are basically sublayers off of disk as payloads, um, you can turn off the entire payload. And what that does is it forces the scene graph to completely recook. So you get the hit. And, uh, but once, it, uh, once, the, once Hydra rebuilds the scene and uh, passes that on to the render delegate, then you can work with much less, which much less later. Um, the one thing about USD is you'll find is it wants to cache everything. And that means memory. So if you're starting to bump up against memory limits, um, load things in as payloads with sublayers, and then or and then simply unload those payloads as you need to. So um, granularity in the payloads is is one strategy you could make. For instance, the rocks could have been a pay payload. Uh, the trees could have been brought in as a payload as well. And if you don't want to see the trees, um, just simply turn that payload off. It forces the viewport to reevaluate, reduces, releases the memory, and you can keep on working. So basically, unload what you don't want to see in the scene graph tree. Um, second thing is prune lops to hide what you don't want. So as we know, the viewport causes cooking. So if you don't see it, um, you won't be able to touch it. You won't be able to change it. Also, plus it makes the viewport uh, less drawing, means much faster. It's that simple. And layer breaks are great for starting edits. And finally, do your work and save your work. So basically use your layer breaks. After that, do your work, capture the edits, and then save your work uh, using configure layer lops or using the, the USD ROP to output your work to disk. And, and generally, if you're not doing any geometry edits, but you're doing more, uh, if you're not touching any of the, the larger attributes such as geometry attributes or massive amounts of uh, attributes, under, let's say your color attributes or per vertex attributes, that might be saved in a crate format a uh, USDC file, but if you're just moving stuff around and changing some material properties and some more of the lightweight type edits, you might want to save it as a USDA or ASCII file. And that way you can, can move your edit. So this is a typical snapshot of one strategy for working. So you might want to compose your graph at the top where you have a reference master scene, and then you have a camera, and then you write the camera to disk uh, using, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, edit, edit, edit uh, layers lot or let it layers lot you can write that out to disk and then you can reference in the cameras with a with a, with a sub layer and you and the way this would work is if the cameras are coming in the right directory you can use sub layer so sub layer is great for not grafting but basically taking whatever scene hierarchy the camera is in and literally laying that over the hierarchy the scene graph that's in here and if there are any um, clashes or, or, or things with the same name, such as same object, same property override in this layer, then the composition rules of USD kick in and then uh, see which opinion wins in that particular case. So the scene graphs is where opinion, uh, it's a great place where these opinions have to be resolved. So then we do that, we build our scene graph, and then we prune, isolate what it is that we don't want to work with. So in this case, you can turn off all the front end of the shop, and then you can put down a layer break. 
and then the layer break is where you can break your scene and then you can do an edit the scene uh, where you can put some edits could be anything that you want to do some material edits do some uh, lighting edits add some lights maybe uh, do some work let's say you're in lighting and you're inheriting the scene you want to do a first pass and set the lighting this is how you would do it you build a layer break and then you do all your lighting work and then you save your edits with uh, with the USD ROP and, uh, and you can have uh, multiple layer you can have multiple uh, uh, conf you know um, configure primitives in here to, to write your USD to disk as you do your work here and then finally capture all of it with the USD ROP and in this case uh, USD A allows um, managers and supervisors to actually see what work you've done especially if you commit it um, very important part of USD is knowing what you changed and when you changed it and that is wholly supported inside of USD and uh, saving out USDA files as text files it makes it really easy to diff these files when it's doing submissions. So that's pretty much the template you want to follow. So much so is if you had a graph like this and if you were in, uh, let's say, a scene editing, you were doing scene editing and this was a very common graph, you could actually grab these operators and just drag and drop them to the shelf. And that will actually create a template for you. That's the easiest way I know to create a template um, to move forward. So here's an illustration of the many different things that can inform Hydra. It's not just the LOPs themselves that tells Hydra what to do and to instruct the render delegates what to do. Um, there's a lot more than that. Uh, for instance, LOPs, obviously, as you move the display flag down, it'll definitely tell Hydra what to do. Also, any edits that you make in the scene graph, it's actually a layer as well. It's an implicit layer that is you're working on in the scene. And it's captured by that, a lot of the work you do in the scene graph tree is captured by that Houdini uh, primitive entry inside of the scene graph as you're working. It also in, informs Hydra to do what payloads to load, what payloads to unload, what to display, what not, not display, um, and all the other options that you have available in there, including uh, setting up uh, preferences and, and options. Then there's also the Houdini display prefs. Obviously, if you open, if you tap the D key on your current Hydra delegate and you change some of the render settings, it as well has to notify Solaris as to what to do. And finally, you can actually even have external applications uh, notifying Hydra what to do as well. So you could actually have a Python operator, open up the Python shell, and you can actually run uh, USD functions or other functions to inform the, the Hydra viewport as well, all working inside of Houdini. Um, and, as a, and as you see, there's a little th in commas or in brackets, Husk. Um, Husk also uses Hydra, so the same thing goes for everything that you're doing with Husk. And... Uh, so many things could talk to Hydra. Now here's another breakdown of the pipeline. Again, so we can have different, different stages inside of your USD graph also working with Hydra as well. Um, model, look, dev, layout, environment, sliding, FX, all contributing layers into the current uh, scene. And you can, make, you can turn these contributions off and on. And Hydra will try its best not to completely recompose the scene as you're working with the data. And here's some of the different applications that we have support in the various different parts of the pipeline. And you can see how complex this all gets and so you could have massive amounts of data with multiple applications generating USD and multiple ways tapping into it and it's all built on top of this foundation of Hydra going all the way back to the first statement I made um, this thing only exists for artists and artists need to see work and generate images or generate model content so um, and of course on top of that it Hydra feeds viewports and it also feeds renderers as well. Those are all the delegates, the, the Hydra delegates that, uh, that, that are used to generate the imagery. And of course, there's Houdini GL, Hydra GL. And as for renderers, there's Karma, Renderman, Arnold, V-Ray, Redshift. And we'll talk about more about those delegates in a bit. So, um, and there's a lot of available Hydra delegates as well. And all you need to do is simply install your render engine. And if it does come with a render delegate, um, it will install on your system as well. If you fire up Houdini, you will now be able to choose that render delegate. But there's a missing piece as well. Um, USD has a pretty complete uh, support for common elements across all renderers in Hydra. But every renderer has its own special environment. So um, we have a way forward for a lot of the render developers to also write a layer 
or a plugin that overlays on top of our own existing operators and they can add your own uh, render operator to set render specific settings that also get saved and passed through Hydra into the render engine. Um, Hydra really has nothing to do with the actual USD geometry whatsoever. It actually just takes the geometry and passes it through and adds properties uh, to the render delegate. Um, and um, again, um, as you install the render delegates, you get more and more options in the viewport. Uh, materials are a constant uh, uh, source of uh, concern. Um, so um, you can build these compound materials with multiple render delegates. And I, um, if you want to, you can watch the recent videos I did on the RenderMan Ship Shape Challenge. The second uh, video I did actually talks about how to build these composite shaders for multiple render targets. And all render delegates use the same geometry lights, cameras, USD, preview shaders. Now, as I said, these custom render properties um, outside the USD spec, well, yeah, the render developers have to provide those and extend Houdini to support those inside of LOPS. Um, excellent examples of that are Arnold, RenderMan. Um, they both provide really good additional operators on top of uh, the standard operators that are shipped with Houdini. Now, so let's take a look at some of the delegates. There's the Storm delegate, which is the, the, the HydroGL renderer, and uh, it's pretty bare bones. Uh, it's, it is the USD default scene render delegate in USD view. Uh, it's very fast, uh, but with that comes compromises. So it will definitely compose USD. Uh, it'll render the USD scene quite quickly. Um, um, it won't have the level of sophistication or inactivity that you would demand from uh, Houdini GL, but uh, it is a very good truth to testing your scene. So that what I mean by that is it will respect the composition of the USD scene. Um, so if you have some USD features in there, um, you can probably count on Husk supporting, or pardon me, uh, Storm supporting a lot of those features. The next delegate is the Houdini GL dele Hydra delegate. Um, what's driving us there is to make sure that it's feature comparable to the Houdini viewport, as well as it allows you to interact with the scene and it provides enough uh, information for to support all of these viewport states that we're building on top of the viewport, on top of Solaris itself. Um, it's under continuous development as we try and add more and more features from USD into the Houdini GL delegate. Um, you know, shader support, material support, and advanced features inside of USD. And it is getting closer to supporting full USD features with backports from dev, from the current dev baseline into Houdini 18, where it doesn't break backwards compatibility. And it's a fantastic default viewport to work for in most Solaris and LOPs. As a matter of fact, it's the first hydro de it's the first delegate I choose all the time. It is the default one when you fire up Houdini. Um, the next one is Karma. Um, you can see I've opened up the display options for Karma. It just tap the D key inside of the viewport, and that gives you access to all the render options um, in the in the current Karma delegate. Um, it, just to be sure, if you do put down Karma render setting lops that set those render settings, um, they may or may not be inherited by the viewport. Whereas these ones have direct control over how Karma rent, or the Karma Hydro Delegate renders in the viewport. You can see such things as pixel samples, um, light sampling mode, light tree, and all the options that you would expect to do rendering in there. So it's very fast to first pixel. Um, that's one of the things that uh, Karma is, is being driven. So trying to get there as fast as possible to first pixel so you can start seeing um, your image form. Um, and it also reads USD as its native scene graph format. There is no translation um, for the geometry itself. Karma supports USD as its geometry format. And uh, whatever USD supports will support. And we're trying to keep it as close to truth with USD as possible. So if there's a new feature in USD, uh, we'll definitely try and make sure that Karma supports that the way that it was intended to be supported. And uh, as you can understand, uh, USD features can be complex, especially with some of the complex compos composition arcs we're seeing with some of the customers building USD scenes. So um, um, it's a it's 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 a constant uh, evolution as we move forward, and the goal is to support Houdini Mantra features for forward compatibility for sure, and it's still in beta for Houdini 18.0. Um, so, um, having said that, um, it is great for doing some things, um, 
but there's other areas that it's still work in progress. Now, the RenderMan 2300 Elegate. Um, the reason why this image is a bit blown out is because I didn't get my materials to go through and the lights were treated a bit differently. So, um, you know, maybe Karma's off on Truth and RenderMan's there or vice versa, but either way, um, it does give you an image and it does render and it does keep the materials in place. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so it's a very fast full featured render engine. Um, it's, uh, it has an extraordinary shader framework. I mean, the, uh, the render man's known for its, it's, it's a uh, complete and documented, uh, shading environment. And there's complete support for the, for the render man shading environment inside of Houdini, as well as you can install, um, the additional render man to Houdini tool set. And you can see how those work again. If you take a look at the ship shape challenge, the, the first and second videos, I cover uh, a lot of these options inside of render man. And you, and you can consider it to be truth in supporting all the USD features, um, given that it's written by Pixar. It probably is the render that's closest to fully supporting all the features inside of USD. And Pixar is committed to Solaris Hydra support, including Husk command line rendering. And uh, you can sign up to Pixar, get your complimentary uh, RenderMan license, and install it and work it. And as somebody that's starting to get into USD, um, it's it's fun to see how easy it is to add these uh, these new render delegates um, and start using them as an alternative to to Karma or the other render delegates that we have. Um, so it's it's a full feature render and it's very well supported inside Houdini. Some other render delegates is Arnold uh, Hydra Delegate. Um, it is in the latest release of Arnold. You can download it, install it. Uh, Rob, Rob Stouffer's done that and he may have already spoken about that earlier. And Redshift is not available at this time, but there is work on a Hydra Delegate. And the AMD Radeon Pro render, we were showing some work in there. And V-Ray not available at this time, but there's some teasing images coming out every once in a while. Um, so no, no time frame on availability for that at this point in time and more. There's lots of uh, Hydra Delegates coming more and more. So let's now see if we can apply some of this to the, the existing um, marketplace scene. Um, this is the graph that was built up by the team. Um, some of the basic areas we have. So up here in the graph, uh, we have uh, bringing in the reference scene, some trees, adding some rocks. And we'll take a brief look at some of this work. And we use a graph operator to bring in some, some uh, background buildings, which I didn't have, so I don't have those layers, but keeping on going down. In this particular tree, we're doing edits, materials, cameras. Notice how we've done that after we've composed the scene. Uh, putting cameras and lights up here, things that are going to be dynamic, that might be editing in the current department that we're working on, uh, may or may not be a good idea. So you want to keep those further on down. And uh, in this particular scene, uh, there are no layer breaks or, or any sort of configure layers to save some of these steps to disk. Um, this is basically just an artist doing some work. You might see this in a commercial department where um, you're just you're just doing some work and you want to get the output out and you're keeping everything within the graph. And you're not really going to be sharing a lot of that beyond this. Uh, your, your primary purpose is to drive images or if you're working within departments, you'd have a little bit more of a breakdown. But here we're adding some lights and we have a light mixer in there that's being set up that uh, controls all the lights. And you'll notice the whole time that I've been poking around the scene, um, I haven't been touching the display flag. And I'm still selecting these operators. And as I select them, um, it selects uh, the current working items inside of the scene graph. So it's, you'll find that unlike with SOPs, um, you're not going to be moving the display flag nearly as much to try and stay as efficient as you can. One of the powerful tools that you can use to, um, when you're working with these scenes in the back end and you want to take a look at the performance is to add, um, add the performance monitor itself. So if you go and you add the performance monitor, um, you can turn record on. What I'm going to do is there's a switch operator in here. So let's see the time it takes to um, basically switch from this part of the graph to just adding a simple camera. And so let's press record. And in the switch, uh, we can then go to switch to zero. And we'll notice that uh, the viewport's taking a lot of the time. Um, we also see that the panes are taking a bit of time and the nodes are almost uh, 
zero part of this. So we can see that op just switching between the, the preloaded nodes and the camera um, would be a bit of a um, bit of a hit. So what I'm going to do is uh, to unload these operators, you can do some pretty harsh things inside of Houdini, because <laughs> it is Houdini. Um, and it's node based, I can delete this. Um, so everything that's outside of this path, I'm going to delete it. And then undelete it. <laughs> And what that does is it uh, it's just basically like completely unloading and reloading the scene. So there's no more caches in there anymore. So we saw that uh, adding the nodes in total was, was minimal. Um, we're talking about uh, 0.1 of a second. Now um, we're going to basically clear all this. And now we're going to switch back again to see um, what kind of an impact we have. So I'm going to clear that. And then I'm going to put the switch to the one. And we can see here now that it's taking a bit longer. And uh, we can see that uh, the nodes are number one now. So to construct all the data inside of these nodes took approximately three, uh, three uh, just a little bit over three seconds. And if you open this up, you can actually see which operators were taking all of that time. And here we can see the material, uh, basically the rocks themselves are taking a long time to construct the USD in memory and then to pass them on. Remember, the majority of the scene, except for that one operator that's bringing the payload from disk um, or, the, or the reference from disk, um, everything else is being constructed as USD right in memory. So um, we can see the stage. So if, if one thing we could do is these rocks, um, we could author them to disk. As a, as a as a you know as USD in a separate file or in this file not attached to this graph and then uh, just use a sublayer to bring those rocks in and that would be that would probably be a little bit faster and uh, but at some point in time you're still going to have to take a hit I mean at some point in time you have to build geometry and you have to load it in so um, there there is always room for optimization but at the end of the day there's no magic bullet um, uh, obviously if something's taking far too long submit a bug um, so now that we know that there's the that we can use this performance monitor to great effect. There are some operators that are pretty, pretty interesting. Um, for instance, we can compare sublayer to merge, and that's, uh, that's, that's an exercise in itself. But just to let you know, um, the sublayer operator itself um, um, allows you to compose USD where the branch input, the path is already defined inside of the USD hierarchy, and you're just literally layering it on top of the scene graph that's in the left input. And once it does that, it does a lot of interesting work. Just like when we hit the switch, before I unloaded and loaded these nodes, it was very fast to switch between them back and forth. So LOPS is doing some really interesting things. Just like in SOPS, each one of these operator was caching its results. So now if I go back to the switch and I clear this and I go back to zero, um, very, very fast. We can see the viewports of the number one, clear that. And let's go back to the first one. We can see that it's very fast. So remember what I said earlier, um, we're building LOPs to be as efficient as possible, respecting memory and kind. I mean, it's uh, loading all of this stuff obviously takes up memory and you can unload operators and uh, um, so it's, it's good, it's important to know that. Now, another thing is if I wanted to do some work on some of the books here as a last minute edit. Let's say I'm in, in lighting and I wanted to tweak the position of one of these books. Um, given the fact that we have this whole graph, make the edit up here where I think it's convenient. It's gonna force everything to transform. And if I add a new book or remove a book, um, which is which you can't do in USD, um, but if for some reason I'm authoring the books before authoring a payload to disk and I remove one of the books, which you could do, um, it will force pretty much everything to, to re to reevaluate in the scene. So that's one of the reasons why USD doesn't allow you to remove a primitive once it's on the stage from you know being referenced either as a payload or as a reference off of disk. So now what I got here is um, uh, later on, the next thing we're gonna take a look at is Husk. And uh, I want to generate um, a USD scene from this so I can render with Husk because right now everything is internalized inside of Karma. Um, or probably everything is, is a lot of implicit layers or, or inside of memory here. And I want to author that to disk so I can put a USD ROP in here. And we'll be using this um, USD scene in the next step when we're taking a look at Husk. So I just want to 
quickly save this out to disk so we can capture all the changes um, uh, after the Karma operator. And then we'll be using Husk on this a bit later on. So back in the scene again, I uh, want to take a look, look at some of the composition rules I just spoke up about a little bit earlier. Um, I'm not noticing any sublayers in this graph, so I figured I might uh, want to have a look at that and, uh, and seeing what some of the idiosyncrasies of working with USD, and we're going to take a look at how this uh, live RPS, the the, the 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 layering strength and priorities that USD uses to compose uh, primitives and their attributes. So what I want to do is uh, take a look at the tree here, and uh, so this particular tree hierarchy is set up to do instancing uh, through the instancer. So, and the way the instancer works is it takes a tree at any root level, at any level. In this case, this tree is modeled at the root level called tree. We can see it has all its different primitives inside of it, all meshes, all, you know, all meshes. Um, and we're using the instancer to create instance trees based on points. And we can see how the scene graph composes all of that. So we have a, a tree, uh, tree entry point, and underneath that we have the prototypes, and then we have the roots, and then we actually have the trees with their materials as the prototype defining where all the tree positions are. And we'll notice that this, uh, that this primitive at the root level is actually a primitive type of point instancer. And that's gonna be interesting to see how this all plays out. So I'm gonna grab this chain and we're gonna add a free tree. Now, remember I'm already working with a fully composed scene that's already done. So, you know, if we were in SOPS, where would you add the tree? You know, well, maybe you put it up where the other trees are and then we'll write it out to disk and stuff like that. But when we're working with USD, uh, it's different. And I'll show you how that is. So I'm gonna alt drag off a copy of this these trees. Um, work's already been done for me, why do I need to redo it? So I'm gonna pull these, um, I'm gonna pull this network small little network down. I'm not gonna graft it in yet. I'm gonna take a look at this and compare it because I wanna add it way down here. And after the switch, I wanna, I basically want to um, add these down in here with a sub layer. So let's all we put on a sub layer. And you've most likely already seen the other operators that are used to compose USD, such as the reference operator and the graft operator. Both of those operators can move, can can reparent these operators. In other words, nest. Uh, they can do nesting. In other words, do some pretty aggressive scene composition that sometimes uh, might be pretty heavy when we're dealing with lots of other work. For instance, when USD has to put a primitive in one in one hierarchy into another, it takes a lot more work than just doing a simple sublayer. And uh, so we'll take a look at that right now. Now, one of the things I've noticed that's quite interesting is these operators are writing to the same uh, layer. That's one of the options that you have with SOP import is that it can actually save a USD layer directly from here and, uh, and, then, um, and then reference that. So I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna basically wipe that off and turn it off off all these SOP imports because they're writing to the same USD layer. Um, I don't want that behavior right now. Oh, and by the way, uh, trees, are, are an entire subject in themselves. Um, you know, how to build efficient trees that scale inside of a pipeline um, is, is a huge topic. Um, but anyway, so now I've got this, this graph here and let's see how this transposes. So here I've got a tree and I, hear, and I see all the different components. We can see that the root tree is a group and that's good enough for me right now. And so, what I can, can do is um, use a graft operator. And the graft operator likes to work with things in memory and I can reparent this. Um, and what I wanna do is I'm gonna attempt to do something pretty dirty. <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can put these trees which are of type uh, transform and call it the same thing as the point instancer. Let's see what USD does. So I'm gonna see if I can layer these trees inside of this tree hierarchy. And so um, if I press on this operator, we can see here that it's tree. So let's try with the graft operator, um, build a little bit of uh, a scene graph hierarchy for us. So let's start off with tree, let's call it the same thing, trees. And let's call this uh, tree, G 
Yom. And let's leave that as that. And uh, let's see how that evaluates. So there's trees, trees, geom, and then there's our, our tree with the material library, and there's our trees going down into there. So uh, that's good enough for me. And the material library, maybe we want to change that as well. It's, it's going under tree. We probably want to trace, call that to, let's leave that as, uh, um, let's see how this graph evaluates to here. So there's trees, tree geom. Because you can see the materials are now living with the tree. But, uh, you know, we'll leave that for now and see how it goes. Uh, we might have to move that material down a little bit. But let's see what happens when... Now, What normally what you would do is you could put down uh, a lop rop. And not that, but... Uh, uh, um, there's, a, there's a lop, a USD rop, I'm sorry. And we can write that out the disk and then bring that in with a with the sublayer itself. We could sublayer that file in. But in this particular case, let's sublayer the inputs for now. And let's see how USD composes this. So remember where we got this object called trees point instancer. And over here we've got this um, USD primitive called trees, but it's a transform. So let's layer this into the sublayer. And let's see what we get. Wow. So what just happened? Um, the sublayer um, saw a conflict. And that conflict was, um, we now just learned to rule, and, and so we're trying to layer um, this part of the tree onto this incoming USD. So one would imagine that this second input is going to be stronger than the first inputs. And you can see here under sublayer position, strongest position. So what's happening is the strongest position is the last one wins rule. And we now know that if we layer a tree transform on top of a tree point instancer, um, the point instancer is completely <laughs> uh, opinionated out of the composition of the scene graph. And welcome to USD. That's probably one of the most frustrating things about USD to those that are starting to work with USD. For me, um, been using it for quite some time, I would expect this behavior. I'd also expect uh, the scene graph to go crazy and to dry, start drawing gross geometry because we can do things with USD that wasn't intended to be done with USD. And of course, we're shaking out all those bugs as we move forward. Um, so um, with the sublayer now, how do we fix this? Well, the answer is, is quite easy. Um, we could try changing some of these positions. We could say weakest position. And that means that the first input would win and the last one would lose. And look at now we've got our prototypes back again. And now we can take a look at the other composition arcs here. For instance, we could do strongest file layers position. So that means if there's files, um, if this was referencing files, the last reference file would win. And so that's how these rules all play out. And remember, um, this live RPS um, stands for, you know, it's, uh, we'll take a look at it a bit later, but basically layers um, beat up on payloads and references. That's the R and the P and the S. Uh, S are specialties, S are materials. But the R and the P of, of live RPs, uh, live RPs, live RPS. Um, so L would win. It's like rock, paper, scissors, right? So L beats everything. And uh, so a layer will definitely override a payload. And that's exactly, and that's exactly what we're seeing seeing here right now. Um, so a last one wins. So be wary of that. So we're going to go back to strongest opinion, strong, strongest position. And what we're going to do in the graph node is something very simple. Uh, we just simply have to change the root parent. Um, two things we could do though. We go further up the tree, uh, further up the graph up here, and literally create a root parent called all trees and nest this inside of all trees. And then we could have brought this inside of all trees and everything would be happily, you'd have then your, your, your point instancer living right alongside the transform underneath the, the one folder. And then you can lump all your trees together. In this particular scene, I don't want to be too heavy handed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put trees uh, geom to delineate this from trees. So I'm now going to have a different entry point on the scene graph for these trees. And now when I go to the sub layer, uh, there's trees and trees geom. So life is happy again. So um, uh, 
how this resolves and how the different renderers see it is entirely different as well. So, and finally, um, once we do that though, something really interesting happens. Um, let's move that tree. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna put down uh, a, a transform. Uh, I could put down an edit as well, but let's put down a transform. And this transform, we wanna move, um, let's see what part of the hierarchy we wanna move. Um, just like in objects, the lower down we can put the transform, generally the better. That means the less that we're moving. And uh, so if we put the transform up at the top, um, that means we're moving everything here and everything has to cascade. But if we put the transform on the, look at the tree is living underneath the material library. That's awesome. <laughs> That's probably not the best composition arc, but we'll live with it for now. Um, so we, we probably want to move the tree there. And so uh, let's, let's put that tree up there. And you can now see that we have a transformer there. So let's, let's pull off of our camera a bit. I could copy this pane, by the way, and, and then work in a proper uh, workflow. And that way I could move the tree inside of the camera viewport. But uh, for now, I'm just going to tumble up a bit. And I want to move this tree over there. So I have some branches cutting into my scene, something like that. And let's take a look at our camera. And you'll notice, oh, shoot, you'll notice how fast that was. So when I move that tree, if I were to turn the, let's turn the, 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 the so let's, uh, let's, let's actually see how this looks like inside of the performance monitor. And uh, I'm going to dolly out a bit and let's start moving that tree. And let's see what the scene is actually evaluating, which is quite interesting. So I'm going to clean that and then I'm going to move the tree over here. So as I move the tree, notice um, it's the viewport that's taking the most time not the network. We can actually see that the node cooking is actually um, quite reasonable, about 0 0.062 seconds. So this sublayer is unlike SOPS, doesn't have to cook all of itself. Um, we're actually getting this really nice behavior where the sublayer is saying, okay, you know what, I'm only going to layer just that one primitive attribute on top of all these others. So it knows um, that the attribute I'm changing on this this tree primitive is the only thing that the sublayer needs to layer. It just happens to cause a huge draw in the viewport, which is why we're seeing the viewport taking so long to draw. That's USD. So, um, so putting, and it's a sort of similar rules inside of SOPs, right? Um, if you're going to do any, any edits, do it down near the bottom. So that way you don't start cooking all the operators up buff. But there's a lot of little subtleties that are happening inside of uh, USD that as you start working on it, turn on the performance monitor, have a look, see what it's doing, and use that to inform your decisions and to study what it's doing. So when it starts going awry or starting taking too much time, you can actually tunnel in and see where it's going wrong. So that's a bit of the little composition rules for today and using sublayer. Um, it's on the Pixar website. If you take a look at, um, they have a web page dedicated to efficient work with USD. And one of the rules that they say is do edits near the bottom. The second one is use sublayer um, as, a, as opposed to using references or grafts um, because, it's, because references or graft, as you can see further on up the chain here, um, they're actually, um, they're actually moving the, the root position of the, of the scene. You can see here, there's a reference right here. And the lights are actually being placed. In a, so we're actually loading in the lights, but we're moving it within the scene graph, as opposed to a sublayer, which cannot do that. So a sublayer, basically, whatever position in the hierarchy is coming in, that's what it uses. So in some ways, it can be very frustrating. On the other hand, um, like I showed in the very first video when we were putting that barrel through its paces. I purposely left it at the barrels level. And the idea is there you'd use like a stage manager to construct the scene or, or your studio has built in um, a USD payload interface that actually can do the same thing. But uh, that's what makes the stage manager such a powerful tool because you can freely parent things. It's the only tool in inside of uh, Sol Sol Solaris Lops that allows you to do all of that. And that hopefully helps clear out some things with regards to um, the composition rules working efficiently inside of, uh, inside of USD and LOPS. Next up is Husk. 
Husk is a command line tool that's used to render our scenes um, and generate images. And uh, it's, it's a very powerful tool and it's based on top of Hydra. And uh, so we're gonna have a take a look at that right now. So the, the first thing we wanna take a look at is Husk is a render agnostic wrapper around a minimal Hydra framework. So that means that Husk works with Hydra. And that also means that every render delegate that supports Hydra can support Husk. And uh, so Husk writes images to disk using supplied USD files at the command line. So it's what marshals uh, data into Hydra, which then triggers the render engines to supply images either to mplay or to disk, more likely to disk. And uh, Husk is written by us, side effects, um, to support uh, Hydra render delegates written by our render team. And Husk supports multiple Hydra render delegates, not just Karma. So it's not just for Karma. It can support RenderMan. And as a matter of fact, RenderMan is actively making sure that they support that. And you can see here uh, the Husk command line dash R Karma and Husk dash R PR Man. So um, you can choose what renderer you want. And USD, all the materials, if constructed properly, will have a render target associated with it, whether it gets rendered with Karma, PR Man, or if it's the USD uh, preview shader, which is used usually by, um, by proxy data, it can also be a stand-in and, and be rendered on your, in your final pass as well. So they're currently, right now, let's take a look at some of the Husk current state of affairs in Houdini 18.0. Currently, uh, the build that I'm using today is the production build that just was released recently, 18.0.460. And right now, there's no progressive M play like there is with Mantra. Um, you have to wait for the image to render it, and then you can fire up M play. Or do what I do, which is, um, um, if you're rendering to TIFF or to our own RAT format, um, in a scanline format, uh, you can run mplay on the file um, hysterically while you see the image uh, move up, um, um, uh, you know, scanline by scanline or line by line. And uh, it's important to also note that there's a f the difference between, Hus between Hydra viewport rendering and Husk rendering. Husk rendering uh, with Karma, that is, um, I should mention that's with Karma. Uh, we're using higher quality sampling levels and, and, uh, and options that makes uh, Karma render more efficiently, hopefully, uh, has to be when you're rendering with Husk versus rendering with uh, Hydra interactively in the viewport. So there will be differences. Um, you'll generally get a higher quality image with Husk and there are different filtering algorithms and, uh, and which results in a final image. And lots of subtle differences from denoising and, and other things that will make the two images differently. Um, uh, there also is support for multi-party XR files. So there's a, we're constantly adding uh, functionality to Husk. And for those features that we can backport from the current production builds internally to Houdini 18.0, we will without breaking backwards compatibility. So Husk, um, command line tool, as we know, and as we and you pass it USD files, be because that's what Hydra takes, and you can pass in any USD files. They could be generated from any application anywhere, and to any supported render delegate. Um, and here's some example um, um, options that I have. Um, uh, yeah, and here's some example command lines for Husk. So. Um, we can, and we'll take a look at um, some common options that we have here. So if you want to freeze this video at a later date and have a look at it and see some of these options and read what they are, um, very similar to the way that you would render with uh, the render command or for rendering mantra. So now let's take a look at Husk Interactive Rendering. This is the part of the video where I hope I don't lose you because <laughs> we're going to be in a shell for the next little while. And um, for those that you don't know, I'm on Windows and I'm using Sigwin, which I highly recommend if you're using Houdini. Um, in this case, I don't have um, Houdini and Baseline installed. So if you want to install Sigwin, install Sigwin. Make sure to install a big subset of it. Go, I think it's sigwin.org. Pick your favorite server, download it, install it. No harm, no foul, but it's a great shell. And I'm going to go to cd to um, c colon slash hfs. 
and then CD, I got a bunch of Houdini installs in here. Um, paint to O. And you'll notice that um, I don't install in the normal directory. I'm still uh, spaceophobic. I don't like spaces and file names. Um, although I should, because I'm supposed to be testing this stuff. But for my own work, I, I generally put it in this HFS directory, uh, the, the root level. HFS is historic for Houdini file system, which is going all the way back to way back to the early days. But anyway, I want to install 4.6.0. So let's go inside of the 4.6.0 directory and ls to list. And you'll see here that there's a Houdini.setup. So if you do source Houdini under Houdini underbar setup, and that installs Houdini. Now I've got my jump path in here that um, it should be under my little my middle mouse button, which it is. It saves me from typing. And uh, CD, oh. Paste. Oh, looks like we're doing it manually then. And I can drag and drop from here. So let's, um, let's go CD, drag and drop from my Explorer window. I just want to save you guys all the typing. And there we go. So we can see here, um, there's the last scene file that we worked on. And now when we were in there last, remember I put that uh, USD ROP down and I wrote out some USD with the camera and, and everything in it? Well, that's what I have right there. There's my master scene, scratch final scene dot USD. And uh, let's take a look at some of the options that we have available for USD. Um, so inside the shell, you can type in husk dash H for help. And it'll give you all the help uh, for this command line tool. And you'll notice at the very top usage is you basically fire off husk. You give it options and you pass in a USD file and it renders something. Um, it's a bit more involved than that, but there's some options that you must put down there. But one of them that's pretty interesting here is USD options. For instance, you can list all the cameras. So let's do that. So dash dash list dash cameras, and this will list all the cameras inside of a USD scene. So you could type in husk dash dash uh, list cameras. And then we can um, bring in that scene, which is um, right there. And, and hit enter. And it'll return, and it should list me all the cam all the cameras inside of that scene. It's a pretty big scene, so it's got to hunt through it and. Uh, it should return and there we go. So it's uh, one camera's found and it gives me a name of the camera, camera's camera one. So now we can fire off uh, a render. And so uh, we can type in husk and uh, so we can type in the render target's gonna be karma. So dash R is for the render target karma. And dash O, uh, let's save it to IP. So I could put a file name in here. I could put in here my image dollar sign F4 for padded numbers, and let's put an underbar, dollar sign F4 dot uh, EXR, and uh, we pass in that, uh, that USD file, and we hit that, it's gonna render an image. Um, but I wanna take a look a bit at some of the idiosyncrasies that we have right now. As I said before, um, if we used to put IP in Mantra, we'd get an interactive preview, which would be Mantra rendering and popping up. We don't get that with Husk um, anymore, but um, at this point in time, okay, this is uh, active work in progress to make sure we can give you guys and girls access to this. So if I fire this off, well, I'm missing res. So, um, so let me add res to that. And uh, actually let's get rid of karma and let's see if we can just fire off just a render like that because we only have one, um, one render delegate. And so it's going, and it'll be firing off my fans pretty soon. Um, it's it, the length of time that you saw it took to return the cameras is the length of the load time for that entire scene. Remember, there's a lot of trees and a lot of leaves in there, into the millions and millions of primitives. So it'll take its time to to work forward. 
And here we are, it's starting to render. It's, it's, miss, it's found some missing uh, texture files that I didn't grab in time to do the recording. Um, but you, it's for the trees, by the way. You can see it's all the, the bark and the, and the trees. Um, but that's, that's also good to know. Now, what makes really, this really handy is Husk now becomes the way that we can render images to render farms or write scripts the exact same way that we've been doing for the last i've been doing for the last 26 years with with uh, prisms and houdini is so rendering all these really writing all these cool shell scripts and integrating these into your workflow and if you're a windows user or a mac user that are not familiar with using shells or even linux users use shells um, you can write little scripts and stuff and hang them together in these days um, understanding this also means that you can use uh, task top operators and task top operators actually use command lines as well so you could actually write your own command line tools and, and usd does come with a tremendous amount of python functions which which definitely makes a lot of use inside of the PDG, something that we should take a look at in the not too distant future. But um, in this case, we're now rendering off. And I'm gonna pause the video now and then we'll start it up when it's done. So I'm already into the rendering and you can see that the CPU is pegged at close to 100% as Husk is working away as I patiently wait for the image to pop up. Oh, and one of the things I should mention while I'm still waiting for the render to pop up, um, Husk also has a whole bunch of options that, that allow us to print out statistics. We could put a redirect after this and put it under uh, check file dot text or um, some of the options that we have for doing progressive reporting um, of the render as it progresses so we could actually see what it's loaded what it's in so all kinds of different levels of verbosity that we can enable inside of husk powerful tools that were available inside of rendering with mantra are also available with rendering with husk it actually works with all render delegates and still waiting for the render, you can see that Karma is basically pegging every CPU at 100%. Um, that's one of the nice things about Karma is it's, it's, it's generating so many threads and it's so paralyzed. It can take advantage of all of your system resources. And about 12 minutes later, the image finally pops up. Um, in mPlay, as we uh, said to the dash O device for output to MP for mPlay. And by the way, um, when you're inside of Houdini and you're using the, uh, the, the Karma render lop, um, it's actually running with Husk. And it's actually uh, an interface to Husk. And you get the same um, options. You can actually specify MP as your display device and it will pop up mPlay when it's done. Or you can render to disk, you'd render sequences to disk as well. So you can think of as when you're inside of the LOP graph and uh, if you put the Karma, Karma render LOP down, you're actually using Husk uh, to do command line writing in the background. I now want to touch on this concept of what is truth in USD. Uh, we saw a little bit of the composition arc uh, shenanigans that you can play earlier on. Um, and it's important to know that when you're dealing with very complex scenes, sometimes you can end, get results that are not quite what you expected. And then if you take a look and you see the composition, you think that it's, uh, there's a mistake being made, uh, we have to have see what features are working, what are not. So there's Hydra views and truth, there's USD view, and inspect layers manually is the three approaches we have to, to see um, what's going on. So uh, USD composition relies on opinions and the composition returns ret uh, rules determined by LivRPS. Uh, the acronym LivRPS uh, is a great way to memorize it and memorize it because it really does help. Um, basically it's layers, um, which are the strongest composition hierarchy or composition um, method you have. Inherits have to do with materials. Variant sets, as we saw variants in the first half, um, they actually have quite strong in the dependency tree. Then we have references and payloads. Um, payloads are the most efficient way to bring data in, and then you can use references to override various parts of the payload. Um, you can then have variants with actually off uh, 
has precedence over that. And then finally, layers can blast everything away if you want, completely changing the primitives um, that are actually in your scene, as we saw when we substituted the trees. And the very end is specializes. That has to do with memory m materials. So inherits and specializes are all about materials. So there's an inherent precedence with materials. So you can sleepily add a material, sneak a material in very end, but then I can go ahead and say, you know, no, 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 I don't like those little materials you snuck in. I'm just going to reapply the materials and it blows away everything away. So this allows us to do sweeping, uh, to introduce materials at a very low level, then apply sweeping material changes right underneath layers themselves. Um, and so depending on how LiveRPS is resolved in different applications differently, what is correct, what is truth. And of course, if you're going through the scene and you think that there's something wrong or it's very slow, please send the bug into support. And so there's alternate tools to Houdini to inspect USD as well. There's the Pixar tools. Uh, there's Storm. You can use Storm in the hydrodelegate inside of Houdini itself. And uh, that gives you a way of seeing how the scene could draw and redraw. Maybe there's a there's an incorrect uh, resolution. So you can try Storm. Um, it being a Pixar tool should be able to read the USD composition and, and render it as a truth. And there's also the RenderMan delegate, which is very, which is, uh, probably the closest as a render delegate is to being able to support all the features inside of USD. And another one is to uh, load uh, and view the scene graph details uh, manually um, using this tool called USD view. So USD view is also a Pixar tool and it allows you to take a look at what's available in the scene. Um, so another way is you can actually inspect the layers directly. Um, you can right mouse on any lop, for instance, and you can see under the USD options, you can view the active layer, the flattened layer, and so on and so forth. Done and conveniently inside of Houdini, but it requires you to actually read the USD um, a text. Um, you can actually directly open the USD files with a text editor if they're ASCII USDA files. Um, so it's a good idea to author USDA files for any edits that you do, as long as some of the attributes aren't like uh, two, two million points. And uh, um, so it depends on the type of um, attributes you're editing on the primitives um, that determines whether or not you can save it to USDA or not. It makes sense. Uh, your supervisor will love you because then they can see any edits you make and everyone's a supervisor. So everybody's happy if you start saving all of your, your edits as USDA files um, so that you can see where you've done your work. Now we're going to install and use USD view. The USD view application might as well cover that. Um, so installing USD view requires compiling the tools from Pixar and it's not straightforward on Windows. Um, thanks to Victor Uden who just a month ago pre-compiled the USD bi bi uh, binaries again. Thank you, Victor. And you can pause here and take a look at the various links, press on them. Um, he, uh, there's also a PDF that he released on how to, how to install it, follow it exactly. And there's also a YouTube video to do that if you're not familiar with, uh, uh, with using shells. Uh, in this case, you're not using shells, you're using the command prompt inside of Windows. And this is USD view. So right now we're going to peel off and I'll show you how to use USD view. Once you have USD view installed and you follow Victor Uden's um, wonderful uh, instructions, you can now double click on any USD file and launch USD view. For instance, I can double click on uh, barrel no lid and it fires up USD view. Now if my OpenGL and USD was properly configured, it would work. Um, I probably have to update my, my USD or probably my, my, my NVIDIA options, but here we can still go and choose the Embry renderer. And here we go, we see the barrel being rendered and it uses uh, the alt key uh, viewport bindings. Now with USD view, you can see um, all the various parts of the stage. It looks pretty sim similar to um, to Solaris inside of Houdini. It's no uh, no mystery about that. Uh, Mark Tucker and the R&D team definitely followed uh, the spirit of USD view when they implemented it inside of uh, Solaris. So we can prick, pick on the various different uh, uh, parts of the scene. You can see that it highlights in yellow. You can actually turn the view off or on. So there's some basic controls here. And we can also see, um, just like inside of uh, Solaris, uh, you can see the actual uh, hierarchy. 
plus you can see the various primitives that are bound or the various attributes pardon me that are bound to the USD primitives remember uh, in USD it's quite simple there's uh, primitives and then there's attributes and one of the attributes are prim vars so you can see the prim vars here display color display opacity they came through quite nicely and we can actually see the value of those uh, those uh, attributes um, we can take a look at the points all the points that are on the current primitive and so on and so forth there's some basic attributes that are baked in as well the bounding box local to where world transform we can also see the metadata associated with any attribute along with the layer stack um, that is currently composed to what we have in the composition arc as well now let's take a look at something a little bit more complicated so let's uh, close usd view here and let's go back up and uh, take a look at the one of the composed USD that takes a look at all the assets. So if I go into the layout directory, um, let's take a look at the full scene with lanterns. Now this will take some time to load. Um, we can see that the USD view loads up quite quickly, but then the viewport uh, forces the evaluation of the entire tree. And you can see there's uh, the, the Python or the, the Windows batch window is complaining a bit about uh, missing textures, by the way. Um, but once it renders, we can now go back to full screen and this comes with the bike background so we can turn the background off and under view we can go in here reset view and it zooms in on our scene and as we pick on the various different components you can see that you can see their bounding boxes and again we can trigger uh, Embry and then we can see uh, the rendered scene but again this is a great way of, of seeing how USD view which is in terms of truth Pixar's truth uh, we can see um, how USD evaluates. Plus, we got a really handy uh, open source free viewer of any USD uh, you can open up on any USD generated by Houdini. And again, it underlines the fact that um, when you're composing these primitives, um, when we took a look at when I talked about in the in the first part, composing USD, um, you know, once you've done your model, um, putting it in the right part in the scene hierarchy it's pretty important because um, every time you have to use uh, every time you have to graft your model into a new position in the hierarchy it requires work on the part of usd and the less work usd does the more efficient your scene becomes we can see here that in this particular shot we have the scene the shop front and all the barrels the barrels that we were picking on for the longest time and you can see how the barrels came in here as uh, applied geometry with the variance and uh, so and again, you can see the purpose is set to default. In other words, there was no render purpose or, or proxy purpose defined on these primitives. Uh, visibility is inherited. We can take a look at the composition arc. For this particular uh, scene, we can see the arc path is slash scene, shop front, barrels, barrels, no lid one, and it has a specification, which is good. And uh, as we go up the tree, we can see the full composition arc of the scene itself. And so really nice way of seeing. Now you get the same view inside of Houdini, but again, how the opinions and how the live, uh, live RPS, live RPS evaluates and, and how different layers compose um, and with all the various different USD files that are being referenced off disk or layers and how they layer on top of it can be easily seen inside of here as well. So it's just an, an al another alternate view to what Houdini offers and uh, rendering with Embry, um, it's pretty it's pretty quick. Um, um, I would say that uh, Houdini uh, it would be faster. It is a faster way of dealing with USD, um, but marginally so. Um, one of the nice features in the USD view is you can actually pick on the various objects and just like Houdini it would actually focus in on the various different props that we're looking at and you can inspect all the properties related to that. There's a whole bunch of options in USD view. Um, we can actually save flat and USD out of here. We can save if we do any sort of uh, change the visibility um, and do some edits inside of here. We can save these overrides as a separate USD layer which we can apply later on. Uh, we can force reload all layers if uh, we've uh, made some changes and we want to reset things or we can reopen the stage, in other words, reset things again and recompose the stage. It'll force a hard evaluation of the scene as well. 
uh, under edit um, um, you can make things visible you can turn visible only so whatever you selection you can there's some nice hotkeys for making things uh, determining what visibility is there you can deactivate certain prims in here to improve the performance uh, you can choose different hydro renders depending on what L delegates and yes you can install different delegates I've heard that even karma can be added as a delegate inside of USD view a couple of customers have done that and the Hydra settings as well, um, Hydra AOVs, you can actually turn the different AOVs on and it'll simply render those AOVs in the viewport if it, uh, it's pretty quick. Um, auto compute clipping planes in case you have very small scenes or very large scenes you can very quickly do that. You can choose what complexity to render with. If I choose very high it seems to lock my machine up so uh, my graphics on this uh, computer might not be up to that challenge and the bounding box. Um, shading mode is quite nice. Uh, you can turn different shading modes on. Color management. Uh, they do support open color I.O. which is uh, nice to see. And uh, you can add to various different lights, camera light and a dome light um, and uh, so on and so forth. You can turn on camera guides and all of this can be customized. Picking mode. Uh, as we saw with Houdini when I did my work I really like to control how you pick. You can pick prims, models or instances so you can control that. In Houdini you have a lot more granularity. Uh, you can even pick uh, components and, and, uh, and uh, different types of the model spec. Um, and finally under window um, yeah we can turn interpreter and the debug flags on and off if you want to see that. And that's USD view. So that completes the pipeline look. Um, I just want to pick up on the first video that I did. Um, I kept it to an hour, uh, just keep on track, but I, I, I missed the part on attributes. And uh, remember what I said earlier that uh, the two most powerful composition arcs in USD, basically it's, it's primitives and then the attributes on those primitives. And so uh, we want to take a, a brief look at what attributes are and some of the controls that we have and what are prim vars as well inside of USD and how they all line up inside of Houdini. So attributes to LOPs. We want to take a look at how do you get attributes on geometry and to LOPs. Uh, so getting geometry attributes from LOPs to SOPs is very straightforward. Um, USD supports attributes as prim vars. Um, so if you have custom attributes on primitives, points, vertices, or detail attributes, when they come in, they're actually tagged as primvars inside of USD. They're attributes of type primvar. And primvars are primitive variables on geometry prims. It's that simple. Primvars can be read by shaders. Um, depending on the shader, you actually have to have primvar loaders on your shaders. And uh, when you're using Karma, we sort of minimize the amount of uh, work you have to do. But if you're using other render delegates, you do have to uh, make sure your shaders are able to pick up these primvars, such as, let's say you want to drive CD color into your material or you have a custom mask attribute on your geometry that you wish to modulate your shader with. Um, then you have to worry about how do you inherit those prim bars. Um, with camera shaders it's as simple as putting a parameter of op to inherit those attributes. But um, we're working on making that easier in uh, an upcoming release. Um, but anyway, common attributes to flow through um, automatically handled for you are all the default Houdini attributes that we know and love, like CD is mapped to a prim var called display color in USD. And alpha is, is mapped over to display, uh, display opacity. So for many, many years, especially myself, using CD and alpha become um, synonymous. I've now had to remap my brain when I'm in USD to display color and display opacity. And UVs are STs, by the way. So here's a chart that shows all the attributes that you would find on geometry primitives and how they map over to USD as primvars. So point attributes come over as USD primvars with vertex interpolation. Uh, vertex attributes are USD primvars with face varying interpolation. These things all sort of make sense. So if you know how vertices are used inside of Houdini, it's basically points define the positions and then primitives are created and the vertices actually line up with the primitives to sew these primitives up. And so that's why primitive attributes are USD primvar with uniform interpolation across Across each primitive. And finally, detail attributes are, are constant um, across all the details. You can, and we usually use details as metadata and uh, holding attributes without having to evaluate SOPs. So that uh, rounds out um, just a quick brief look at Houdini geometry attributes as they map over. And thank you very much uh, for hanging on this long, and uh, uh, see you next time.